Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm just going to take a few moments to introduce the video that comes after this introduction. As you all might be aware, this semester I'm teaching online class classes, and we often have at least one or two live sessions every week. But of course, for privacy reasons, I cannot make those sessions available publicly. So what I've decided to do is to edit some of those online lectures as they are recorded and extract from them some useful materials that I can share publicly with a wider audience. So with that hope, I will be making some of these class sessions available to you over the semester. Uh, I hope this is useful to you. I hope you can use these in your classes, and uh, I hope you can also use them personally for your own education. Where we had uh, left our discussion in the previous conversation was uh, she first laying out how she intends to read the figure of the third world woman, and not just as a biological category, not just as a racialized individualistic category. And then she goes in to explain the concept of relations of power, right? And the idea is that we all exist in a certain web of power and that concept of relations of power cannot really be understood uh, without an understanding of Gramsci, but also without an understanding of Foucault and how power works. And within any given relations of power, there is always usually a dominant discourse or a dom dominant constituency and human individual and collective identities are constructed within that web of power. And that's why she discusses a certain peculiar westernized masculinity emerges, let's say in colonial India. And that is the masculinity that the civil servants must perform. But then that masculinity also becomes an analog for Indian middle-class men who must go and work in the public sphere. But then that construction of masculinity and the rules that it follows, the power that it has legalistically and in the courts, in the public sphere, also shapes women's responses to it, right? Or women's life in that culture. And so that's why towards the end of that section that we discussed last time, what she insists upon is that in order to read the figure of the third world woman, she would rather read it as a figure of resistance and then track those resistances. So making resistance kind of a common denominator for studying or talking about the third world woman. And what that is what she calls the common context of struggle. Right, that maybe we can center that and then talk about. But then she discusses around uh, page 56, I think, is where she gives us the five registers under which she encourages us to study the figure or the collectives of the third world women. And those registers she calls them five configurations. So the idea is not to read the third world woman solely in terms of a universal gender or in terms of just one single race or color, but to plot the third world woman as a collective or even as individuals within certain power relations. And there are five power dynamics or configurations that she suggests that bear upon third world feminism and that we need to read third world feminism within those five configurations. So the first one is um, to take into account what role does colonialism, class and gender all three play when it comes to the rights of women. And we briefly talked about it, right? And we'll talk a little more about it. The second one is how does the functioning of any given state and the rules of citizenship that it develops or implements, which impact the native populations, but also immigrant populations. And within that, how does it impact the gendered uh, 
populations, that is another configuration in which we can read the struggles of the third world women. Now, we already know that she has taught us that when she mentions the third world women, she's not just geographically talking about women who live in the so-called third world. She's also working in solidarity with those who struggle against the same registers, race, national, national policy and all in the metropolitan culture as well. So that includes African-American women, that includes scholars who are uh, Chicano, Chicano scholars and Latino, Latina scholars, all the categories that are already in struggle over here. So that's the cartography of struggle that she's giving. And the third configuration that she talks about is the role of multinational capital in the developing world, but also over here. So these are the three material kind of registers that are juridical, legal, or economical. And then she gives us two conceptual registers or philosophical registers or registers that are strictly connected to production and dissemination of knowledge. So fourth register then is anthropology, the discipline of anthropology and how does it study the native culture and what kind of roles does it assign to the native woman? And the last one then she's, which is more pertinent to all of us who write or all of you who are creative writers, the role of consciousness, identity and writing. So these two are kind of, I would think on a higher level of abstraction because they deal with discourse and they de deal with cultural production and production of the other in research. So these are the five registers, five configurations she mentions, which are, will enable us in her words to study third world feminism without reducing it to whatever assumptions the Western feminists might have and without reducing it to any kind of essentialism or essential gender because these five configurations allow us to study the struggles of third world women within the complexity of the material world, but also conceptual configuration of the third world. Does that make sense? I mean, there is nothing in this book that is not strategic, okay? And so she is trying to, you know, articulate, here is how I want to complicate the idea of a simplified and reduced figure of the third world woman. And we can talk about it. Um, I will just give you like a just brief understanding of what I understand from each one of them. We basically already discovered, discussed the colonialism class and gender one last time where we had talked about how, because of the hegemonic practices of the colonizers, she gives us the example of India, since their main concern was to keep a stable public system, uh, they basically end up concretizing and further ossifying the gender hierarchies that might have existed. And in that sense, then the, the native men probably are appropriated and incorporated within the public sphere. And they develop a kind of masculinity, which has to, within the symbolic order, has to perform a certain identity. But at the same time, since they are working through the tribal elders, the village headmen, the land owning classes, they also then, encourage them to maintain their social hierarchies, maintain their gender, gender hierarchies. So as a result, after about 200 years, let's say when India emerges out of colonialism, it emerges having not dealt with for 100 or 150 years with the development of gender identities and gender politics in comparison to, let's say, as it was happening in England, or rest of the world. But it also then creates a constituency of men who become reformers and who try to reform women's rights, even though 
their attempt is to incorporate women in the public sphere, give them more access to the public sphere, but it also in a way inscribes women in, in a sort of a patriarchal order. And then the question of nationalist struggles within which also, especially in India, women, even though they participate in it, right? Participate in the rallies, participate in public discussions of freedom, but they have to perform an identity of a proper Hindu woman or a proper Muslim woman, because if they looked Western or acted so-called Western, they would already be suspect. They won't be considered in sync with the nationalist movement. So colonialism, its legal, legal systems then create a discourse within which a certain kind of womanhood is, womanhood is produced. It is still diverse depending on the region and class where you are but it has its implications. And then how do women develop their own voices in it, right? Through writing, through journalistic work um, and through active politics. That is what she covers under this. That is the state and citizenship question. And she goes through mostly most of the United States racial laws and the British immigrant laws. So they impact the immigrant communities. Some of them are considered white, some of them are considered black, that has its implications for them. But also in most of these policies, women are automatically assigned the role of the dependents. Okay, they can't apply for citizenship alone, but they can accompany their husbands and they can come and join. Sometimes they can't join their families. And all of that has implications for women's struggles. But when they come over here, even if they are here in the early uh, factories in New York and California and elsewhere were highly staffed by women, intensive sewing and other labor jobs were feminized and then they were treated as inferior labor. So that is part of, in most of the cases, legally uh, done. And that plays a role in how women emerge in these through these laws. And then what kind of struggles do they have? Then their struggles aren't just, you know, I want to come and work in the United States. The struggle is also, can I then call my family here? Now, these rules still apply in so many metropolitan cultures and countries, and they impact women's lives you know, in more terrible terms. Uh, there is a, okay, so I, I'm losing my strain of thought. So coming from that to anthropology, right? Uh, it's not just that anthropology has a certain Euro, had a certain Eurocentric bias it was also that they offered themselves as a science, right? And the vocabularies were always, you know, primitive cultures within that primitive women. And so they kind of already constituted these people as primitive, unless like people like Levi Strauss and Johannes Fabian and others come along and complicate that picture. But anthropology as a study of other cultures then enables first of all, creates bodies of knowledge that are believed in, that are followed about the native cultures over here, but also about the women in the developing world in Africa. And of all the disciplines that study human cultures and human lives, what she's trying to suggest is that anthropology has the most influence in defining how to study, but how to represent the cultures of the global periphery or native cultures over here. And, and you can see that, that it will then impact people writing about it too. If you have read Edward Said's Orientalism, you already know how that happens, right? If you want to write uh, a novel about Egyptians, what will you do? You will do your research. If you want to know how the contemporary Arabs in uh, Egypt behave, you'll go to a couple of books, right? Those books are mostly written by anthropologists and people like that. And their biases then will become your primary knowledge. And based on that, you will go and write a movie script and you'll go and write a short story. 
and a novel. So that's why anthropology has such a huge impact on cultural production itself and how the figure of the third world woman is produced in that as a victim, right? Or mostly as even sympathetic representations will end up being giving you a victim story. It probably uh, will not be a story. And, and as, as this other, right? As this alien, sometimes exotic, sometimes victimized, right? What's, what she, she's heading towards is forcing the metropolitan critics, especially feminists to say, first of all, you have to read the figure of the third world woman differently. You can't take your individualistic humanistic assumptions about what constitutes agency, what constitutes an individual and then apply them there and find them wanting. You have to be able to, and that's her next point, consciousness, identity and writing that instead of a memoir being about me, myself in the world and my own history, you have to be open to reading collectivistic memoirs, stories in which the, the storyteller or the narrator or the recorder isn't the main character, where the story isn't about how I lived my life and finally got here, which has different voices, which could be six grandmothers and two children, right? Uh, remember the, the time of the butterflies, right? Stories that come out of Latin America, they're always stories, if they're written by women, they're stories of a collective identity, right? And collective struggles. Let me not lose my thought. That idea of passivity is because the agential subject that we imagine, let's say in American fiction or in Western fiction is uh, a subject that can affect change, right? So if you take that yardstick stick and read a story by a woman, you know, from Bangladesh or from India or from African-American community, where the story is about here is what happened to three generations of our women. And the story is of that struggle, but also of surviving that struggle, which in itself is an agential act, right? The only reason we can't read that in it is because we are applying our own Eurocentric tools to that storytelling. This happens a lot also to the to testimonial, the, the genre of writing that comes from Latin America where an expert goes from here, but he or she collects the stories and then renders them into a written form for people to read. And, and so, and, and who, if you go to Johannes Fabian's work, Time and the Other, he points out this conundrum in Western ethnography, but also in um, anthropology is that when the Western researcher goes and studies another culture, let's say they are in the Amazon and they are talking to this tribe, they automatically assume that, that, that the figure of the ethnographer lives in the present and they place this their other in another time, in, a, in another temporality. And that is what Fabian calls uh, the allochronic time, allochronic discourse. And that's a discourse which places the object of study or the subject of study already in another temporality, even though the exchange is happening in present time, right? And so then he develops this idea of coeval study where you assume that you are in the same temporality and are having a conversation. And the difference is not that developmentally those people have not reached the present, but the differences could be then infrastructural. They could also be about a question of choice, not being a part of whatever the present of capital is. But writing that section is really important to her in this book and to us because that is what we do. How we write a story but also how we consume it and what yardsticks that we bring to it to judge it and to measure it. So so being after she's done with these five configurations I mean what she's trying to teach us is if you are going to study 
third world feminism. Don't reduce the third world woman to a single signifier. Don't just read her in terms of gender, in terms of patriarchy, right? In terms of even development, read her within the context of her struggles, collective, not necessarily individual. The resistances that she or her group mobilizes against the power, but how is power working there, power colonial, power governmental, power patriarchal, how does it create human subjectivities within an environment like that? And then what role does state play, immigration rules and laws play? And we haven't even touched upon the multinational capital, right? How does it go and accentuate the cultural hierarchies and the cultural inequalities. But even there, she doesn't want us to read third world women as victims of global capitalism, but rather as how do they cope with it? How do they build solidarities and fight against it in the private sphere or in the public sphere or at a place where the distinction between the private and public sphere is no longer possible? Now I'm gonna briefly talk about the multinational capital. Remember, I mean, in order to understand how capitalism works, I mean, the principles are very simple, right? I mean, you can read your marks and everything else. I mean, if you look at the productive process, there are first of all, two main constituencies, right? The mode of production and productive forces. Right? The productive forces is the labor, right? Mode of production is who owns the industry. So what do you do to create a commodity? You gather raw materials, you give it to the workers, they transform it into a commodity which is exchangeable, right? Whatever you purchase your commodity for, if you bought it for $5, you will build those $5 into the price of the commodity, right? That is your fixed expenditure. Labor is your variable expenditure. Right? Everything that you have to spend to procure the raw materials and to house them, electricity, insurance, everything else, all of that is passed on to the customer. That is the base value of the commodity. So the profit then is how cheaply can you make it? because labor is the only invariable there, right? Price of labor would reduce or increase your profit, right? Because of that, then the industries go to other parts of the world, right? Looking for precarious labor through corrupt governments, through patriarchal systems, which they can mobilize to their own profit. So that is why as a process, female labor tends to become labor, intensive labor jobs become feminized. How do you sell it to a family uh, in Pakistan? You know, any village, what would be ideal for them? Originally it was, you go to the poor communities and you say, we will bring jobs for your women. We'll build a factory, right? And the women will come to the factory. They are searched when they come in. They are searched when they go out. They are highly regulated when they are in the factory. But the problem with that was that they would always develop some kind of lateral solidarities. They'll start talking to each other. They'll develop connections with local unions, then international unions, because factory floor is the place of absolute exp um, oppression of the body, but also the place of possibility. That's where labor movement comes to be. Right? It's born there. So then neoliberal capital shifts gears, right? It starts playing with the differences. It starts going to these communities and starts playing with the gender hierarchies that already exist. So now you go and bring the job to them. It still is doing the same thing for you. It's getting you cheap labor. And it's allowing you to externalize your expenditure on electricity, on machinery, on insurance, or anything else. So, so it is more profitable for global corporations to work outside the factory floor, right? Or to work through deeply exploited labor. 
Now, if we are going to talk about it then, then we have to see how this system of economics comes up against women's lives collectively and individually in the developing world, but also over here. And then how do they develop lateral alliances and resistances sometimes, you know, in concert with their male counterparts, right? So it's no longer just a women's struggle. Uh, sometimes, you know, they will go to their religious leaders and that's how they will mobilize their struggle. So it depends on who is exploiting them, how the system of exploitation works, who benefits from it, and then what we need to account for if we are going to publish their testimonials or if they are going to write their stories, they will be collectivistic stories. They'll be stories of struggle and we shouldn't look for this, you know, the kind of romantic individualism that we assign to a good narrative in the Western tradition or in the feminist tradition even. It could even be a story of, I'm a good housewife, I take care of my children and I go and work in the factory, but then I go and hang out with other women in my village. We talk about what happened at the job and we try to figure out how to get our husbands involved so that we get better pay. That complexity will then allow us to still read these women, not necessarily just as passive victims, but also agents of change within the relation of power that they exist. And I think that's what she's trying to insist in this chapter. In, a, in an appendix to Capital Volume 1, uh, Marx discusses two concepts. And those are the formal and real subsumption of labor. Okay. So the formal subsumption of labor happens when capital is rising, but it has not really obliterated the old feudal system. So it incorporates the labor in its project, but retains the feudal structure of the labor and its obligations. And then when capital is totally ascendant, it becomes real subsumption of labor, labor becomes wage labor and they don't have any feudal obligations. They don't have any rural base or anything. In most developing economies like Vietnam, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that real subsumption of labor in certain industries has not happened, right? So most workers, let's say in, in South of India, but also in Pakistan who work for the factories or who work for a family. Now, Balram Halwai is a driver in private service to a rich family. They have a rural village in which their extended families live, and they go to the cities and rent their bodies and work and send money back. So in that sense, his grandmother as a matriarch is this autonomous woman. She might depend on financial resources from him, but she regulates the life of the whole family. Right, that's a thing. But in his case, if he needs to make a change in those individualistic terms and move upward and pull himself through his bootstraps, it's not his individual decision. If he defies his masters, he knows that they'll go after his family. Right? And that's exactly what happens. Remember, in the novel, he kills, you know, the guy he works for runs with his money and only other person of his family who survives is the nephew who lives with him and they are the ones who escape. That's the price that he played. That's why he's the white tiger, one of the very few people who can take, make a decision like that. But the more important thing with a lot of people miss is the kind of business that he creates, right? If you read what kind of a business he creates, you see he now has created a collectivist socialistic business model where every woman who works for his company, everyone who works for their company are taken care of, they are given transport, they are treated well, they have health care, they, their rights are protected. So the idea is that this guy, this Balram Halwai, 
was raised in this form of capitalism. And then when he takes the wealth of his oppressors and builds his own business, transport business, he is building a worker-friendly business. Now, the beauty of the novel is it, it is an epistolary novel, right? Uh, it is written in forms of letters to the Chinese premier who is visiting India, right? And these are really funny letters. There are two novels that came out that year. This one got more attention, uh, Adinga's novel. But there was another novel by Mohsen Hamid, I think, uh, which was called How to Rise in Filthy Asia. I have a published article on that one. But they that is that is a novel which for which for emulates the self-help book model. So that book, that novel is written through the voice of a first person narrator who's giving you 10 or 12 lessons in how to succeed in the rising Asia. So these are two really interesting novels I, I would highly recommend. I don't even know where my article about The White Tiger is being published. I think it's part of my next book. I have written it, it's somewhere on my computer, but but good point, yes, absolutely. Because we can't read these novels simply with Eurocentric assumptions of individuality, of upward mobility, or individual agency. We have to, as she points out towards the last section, that writing is crucial. These women are telling their stories, they are recording them, they are sharing them, but as, she cites Gloria and Zuelda as she talks about border thinking. The writing is neither this nor that. It has an ambivalent location. And we as readers need to read it with that kind of complexity. Oh, I mean, the reason I like Levi Strauss's intervention was that after he goes in and starts his, does his studies, one thing becomes impossible and that is to measure native or so-called primitive cultures with a, with a Eurocentric yardstick, right? Because what structuralist anthropology in a way inaugurates is this idea that these cultures need to be studied within the logic of the structure within which their actions are produced, right? And that was a revolutionary idea because then in order for you to go and study. And if you read Pierre Bourdieu, he kind of builds on that, right? Because he theorizes the concepts of habitus, the concepts of the field. Uh, and so in, then if you really want to study a culture, you don't just have to go and study, you know, how power works there. And, and that culture itself becomes its own reference. The best wonderful reading by Bourdieu of a when he was studying these um, tribal cultures, I think in Algeria, he tells this story of, uh, of a, a carpenter, I think, who had just finished a project, right? And traditionally within that tribe, when the carpenter finishes a project or a mason finishes a project, the family for whom that is working, the reward is symbolic and the, by symbolic, the reward is they hold a feast, right? But the most scandalous thing in that exchange was if the Mason said, hey, could you not do the feast and just give me the money for it, right? And that would be considered uh, the most scandalous thing because he had expressed the naked truth of capital instead of the symbolic capital that would have given him that honor. And so he gives you the other examples too, that in, 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 tribal, in the tribe that he was studying, the, uh, the tribal elder who was the respected elder because he had more lands and more resources, but that aspect of it was misread. And it was read as if he was wiser and he was the one who had the right to have opinions, whereas the reason behind it was capitalistic, right? So what would these tribal elders do? They will go and buy like a pair of oxen, like the most beautiful oxen in the region at an exorbitant price, 
And if you looked at it from the capitalistic point of view, it made no sense because you knew that even if those two oxen plowed the fields for the rest of their lives, they will not pay for their price. But the symbolic capital that they accrued to the person who owned them was intangible, but was more valuable because you weren't purchasing those two oxen because you needed two oxen to plow your fields. You were purchasing them because you wanted to be known as the person who owns the two most beautiful oxen in the region. And that entire realm can only be studied if you understand symbolic capital. So coming back to your question, uh, I think when it becomes kind of when structuralist anthropology starts reading the structure as this over-determining factor, then it becomes a problem, right? But when it was launched and when it begins in the morning, it was revolutionary because it decenters the European self and encourages the anthropologist to say, I cannot study the League of Iroquois according to the 17th century British law in order to understand whether they were civilized, whether they knew right from wrong, we have to first go and learn the structure within which they performed their actions, what was their law, and if it was consistent with that, then we can say, turn around and say, this was a highly civilized group of people. That's the distinction that we, that structuralist anthropology lets us make. And that, that then, just like in any dialectical process, we have to imagine these native culture also cultures also as dialectical, which means they are capable of change from within, but also in response to the outward imp uh, uh, incoming imperatives and change. And then if you bring in a little bit of economics, then you learn whether or not they are sustainable over time because they are also up against the drive of the developmentalist capitalism and you know it's acquisitional drive and good so i mean the idea is that the reason we are reading this book or the reason we read other books is to enable ourselves to craft a critical self that can to understand that we ourselves are not naturally who we are, right? That we are a sum total of, if you go, um, you know, if you go by a novel, uh, if you go by Faulkner, we are a sum of our mistakes, right? But, but we become who we are as critical readers because of what we have read, what we have heard, what we have internalized, what, what we have sifted through, right? And every act of reading or writing then brings to fore that subjectivity, right? And so this idea of my individual subjectivity in so many ways is also socially constructed, right? The belief in it. I mean, think of it. I mean, we talked about, you know, the most militant individualistic people in this country right now are the right-wing fanatics, right? They are the ones who freedom and everything else, right? But how individualistic can you be if you believe in one man as your savior? Right? So they don't see the contradiction, right? Uh, right? So how that we can have these mythologies of individualism and freedom, but we connect it to certain actions, but on a larger scale, um, we realize that, you know, we can be led by one person. I mean, think of it. I mean, it's just like me saying that, hey, you know, in the Islamic world, what the mullah says, everyone does, right? Which is itself a huge generalization. But literally in so many ways for so many of these people, what one person says is what they would do. And, and that is the most the least individualistic mode of thinking the world and acting in it, right? So, so rhetorically speaking, there can be constituencies who are one way, right? In their performative identity and completely different, you know, 
on another end. So this concludes this edited version of a live lecture. I'll be back with more and please keep an eye out for these and I hope these are useful to you. Thank you so much and as always, peace and love.